Hey, family. Thank you for turning into Our Roots Podcast with Joseph Babaifa, where only the strongest roots see the light, brought to you by Botanica Candles and more. And if you haven't had the opportunity, please hit that subscribe button and tap on that like button. We got a great episode for you guys today, one that we're really excited about. And today we're going to be interviewing and speaking with a gentleman who has a bunch of qualifications and a bunch of different uh, disciplines. First and foremost, um, he has a PhD. Apart from that, he is initiated as a priest within Ifa and Orisha. Join me in welcoming Dr. David Brown. Good evening. Hello, Joseph. Iburu Boya. We're going to have a lot of fun, I can tell. Dr. Brown, Dave, we appreciate you so much for taking the time to uh, sit down and speak with us. Um, needless to say, we've been interacting and friendly um, for quite some years. And, you know, to see the, uh, the quality of literature that you've been able to produce and the honor and prestige that you've given to our community um, within academia is um, definitely deserving of merit. And that's why, you know, we were so excited to have you on. So we really appreciate that before we uh, go any further, for sure. Thank you. So, you know, we're, we're big on backstories here because, you know, we can look at the final product, PhD, you know, Olorisha, you know, so many accolades, but, you know, people want to know how we got there, right? So um, give us a little bit about, about your background, uh, you know, where are you from? What does kind of your beginnings look like? I was born and raised in New Jersey, um, Edison, New Jersey. It might help me if I could see you actually while I'm speaking. Is there a way to do that? Awesome. Perfect. Yeah, definitely. We split the screen. Come on, Phil. <laughs> uh, I was born in New Jersey in 1957. Um, pretty normal youth, uh, with the exception that I was eccentric. Um, from my father, I was, for most of my life, contrary and unpleasant, because he was a man of few words. Uh, near the end of his life, he realized um, maybe there was something different about me and said, David, you're sensitive. So I started with art and music very young, which I owe to my mother. Um, I get a current of culture and art and music from her side of the family. Um, both sides of the family, I guess you could say, hard work, sacrifice, and survival through the depression and the immigrant experience. Um, I made films, sculpture, and art at a very young age, but um, my parents disabused me of having any kind of career as an artist or anything outside of essentially the two careers you can have if you're Jewish, which is a doctor or a lawyer. Um, it took me quite a long time uh, of struggle. And um, I was studious and I was creative. And, um, but I pursued pre-law went into college and, and got a BA in government, uh, essentially second semester, my senior year, uh, I took art and um, a famous environmental artist said, well, you know, Davey, you're an artist and if you choose any other career, uh, you'll be very happy for the rest, unhappy for the rest of your life. And um, I did not choose to be an artist, but I have managed to pull some happiness uh, and satisfaction out of this life. And I uh, I thank the Ocha for that. Um, I went to graduate school with a lot of experience in uh, black music and photography and was very interested in studying uh, or working on a social history of, of jazz music. Um, in a strange way, uh, I needed together an approach that I guess I would call kind of visual anthropology, uh, bringing together art history on the one hand uh, and ethnography, you know, a subfield of anthropology. On the other hand, um, I think I would say uh, a particular professor allowed me to have an epiphany as far as 
what I was interested in, where I could go, and that in fact I could do it. Um, Robert Ferris Thompson um, was a graduate professor of mine, um, and his lectures, which I attended every day, were you know exciting, informative. Um, his example convinced me that in fact I could work in this field. Um, his work was interdisciplinary multimedia. And so one day he had a group of Bata drummers to Timothy Dwight College, of which he was the master. They happened to be uh, Luis Balso and Frankie Malabe, uh, two really important um, Puerto Rican Latin popular musicians who had worked on um, bata music, essentially learning it from records. Um, and they invited me to my first tambor um, in April 1983. And uh, it was, I guess I could just say it was a revelation. And um, I was somewhat naive as a field worker. I showed up to a temple in New Jersey where a tambour was being prepared. I had all my cameras hanging off my body. I had a Nakamichi portable tape recorder and draws nice. just dropped around the room. Um, but they were very kind to me, very accepting. And um, the Santeras were very dubious of my project, but um, the Baba Lao. I guess he took a look and they said, you know, he's serious, just, you know, give him some space. And that was really the beginning of uh, very serious field work in New Jersey. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Uh, I'm sure you have follow ups. No, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I have to ask this question because I remember the first time I heard the sacred drums of Bata and, um, you know, I've I've heard the opinions of so many others, and I'm gonna get yours now. I remember it was it was moving, it was very emotional, it was like you say a revelation. I would go even further and say it was an awakening. You know, when you actually saw um, the drums being played and the cadence and the symmetry and ultimately the music, what was going through your mind at that point? What were you feeling while you were on this project? Well, I will say that I had heard examples. Uh, what I first heard was the Oro Seco. Uh, I arrived early uh, in this temple. They were very punctual. They started the Oro Seco about 10 in the morning with an interest in finishing it relatively soon so that the Anya brothers would sit down at the table with the Babalaos. Um, I just felt that it was just voices crying out, voices piercing the silence of this room. It just seemed that time kind of stopped uh, and the Bata essentially choreographed a very different space and, and time. Um, and I was just blown away by the concentration of the drummers, the concentration of sound, the fact that they were on three chairs with the drums on their lap facing this very powerful throne of Shango. I didn't know very much about it at the time, um, but it was as if, let's just say that you took all the power of a Broadway show where you're sitting in the front row and you've compressed it into a small room uh, in a little uh, post-industrial town in New Jersey off of, you know, Route 1 with trucks going by. Um, and you just entered this space and you really just transported. Um, but it's also very obvious that it's, it's not music for the sake of music or for the sake of art. I mean, people are there because of their devotion. They're there because they have you know, very genuine hopes for, you know, their health, their family's health, their well-being for the future. And um, the people there made it very clear uh, what the, the function of the drumming was and that there's a that there's a goal. And 
it was familiar to me in the sense that it's it's not exotic it was not like going abroad it was really like being home but with a different frequency um and a different sense of how you could get to a to, from a to b i really felt uh and also they were so you know warm and accepting and kind that i didn't feel like i had to tell them what i believed it was really just my project was essential to me and if i was there to do it uh in a way that was respectful um they were very happy to have me and uh, i developed lifelong relationships with the people there in particular uh melba cachillo uh adebi a tall priestess of obatala who made the ocha in 1971. Wow. Um, she really grew up in new york in the puerto rican context and um she's been a kind of surrogate madrina for me for many decades no that's beautiful and and you know the music of bata i've experienced this phenomenon as well i remember i think it was the last drumming i was involved in or had before i actually got sworn into the drum um and i remember speaking to my godfather danny and mm. i remember telling him i said i don't know I'm, I'm not trying to make this up but i feel like i'm hearing voices bounce off of the wall and he said you're ready now you know and it was it was kind of like this thing where he says i don't know how but when they call it a talking drum you hear it's it's not like words it's almost like it, it reminds me of when ace ventura was running through the jungle running from the blow dart and he just you know was hearing footsteps and hearing voices and it's just this tonal percussion that you know is just very very rustic so i i definitely understand and you know after going through you know this bombastic experience of you know this percussion this this culture seeing the throne seeing the brothers seeing the process you know what what were your next steps at that point at what point were you like hey i'm definitely more intrigued by this and you know even more than a project you know i might want to get formally involved and become a part of this community good question that didn't that was 1983. Uh, that really didn't happen until the first time I went to, to Cuba. In 1983, really through 1986, um, it was part of an intellectual journey, an aesthetic journey. Uh, I was just enchanted by the aesthetics, first and foremost, because I grew up listening to music from when I was five years old. and. Um, by that time, I had heard essentially every aspect of the jazz avant-garde. Um, I was just enchanted with music. And I wrote seminar papers for Robert Ferris Thompson. I presented um, the photographs I had taken of the Shango throne to a seminar uh, of Robert Ferris Thompson, a graduate seminar. Um, and I started my you know, quote unquote, field work in Union City, New Jersey, 45 mm. minutes from me. Part of the fascination and the revelation was that I grew up in central Jersey in suburbia, a rather you know normal existence um, with the exception of all my eccentricities. Um, and I discovered that essentially there was Savannah you know, 45 minutes from me in Union City in West New York, mm -hmm. and that I could walk into a botanica and everything I had learned in graduate seminars, it was there. Uh, Shango thunder axes, statues of Elegua, uh, pots, beadwork. Uh, the botanica, it was really like it was like a treasure palace just for just waiting to be put together as an altar and uh, i think the the altars and the thrones were fascinated to me i started to collect the objects i started to group them together at home um in 1986 i had the opportunity to go to cuba um, i signed on to a cultural trip to cuba which was in fact um 
July 1986 was the second Folk Cuba dance and drumming seminar at the Palenque, which was the somewhat of a strange experience at the time because um, very few people, very few Americans really were able to go to Cuba uh, before 1986. There was a slight opening toward the end of the Carter administration when Cubans were allowed to go back uh, and I heard some stories. Um, it was the second Folk Cuba, the first of which was in January. This was the second one in July. It was a program to teach foreigners what had become essentially the national folklore of Cuba, the Abaqua, the Arara, the Congo, the Karawali. Um, and by that time, having met a very, very smart, kind, benevolent Babalao by the name of Luisito Castillo, Ocheni Logbe, um, from New Jersey. Um, he had started to help me with my research. Uh, I had started to do genealogy work uh, in New Jersey, and he had come to the United States uh, around 1968 with the flights out of Aradero. And so he knew I was going to Cuba. He said, well, you know, I have some things I want to send to a colleague there. Um, and I drove to the temple and he had a package waiting of some uh, camisetas de perro, you know, those traditional oh, camisetas with the three little yeah. buttons here, if you had the uh, a pair of shoes buttons, and socks, really and he wanted me to take them. He wanted me to take them to his colleague, Edmi Valera, uh, Oturasa, who lived in Cayo Hueso. Um, but the important connection really was, is that Edme Valera's adopted son, um, Miguel Angel Castillo, Oyecum Viroso, uh, who had made Ifa with Edme in 1963 in Havana, had gone to New Jersey in 1980. And he participated in the founding of the temple. He was the godfather of the Anya that they consecrated in 19. Uh, 83. Um, he had married a Panamanian uh, and he was moving back and forth between Cuba and Panama just prior. And so this was the Ifa pipeline uh, directly to my future godparents' house uh, in Calle Hueso, uh, in the Callejón de Animas, entre Aramburo y Hospital, kind of in the shadow of that tall Hospital Almejera. And um, he became very quickly my godfather. But it wasn't until uh, three more trips that he gave me the hand of Arula. Um, but I would go on these cultural trips and we'd be, the bus would be driving us around the Havana and they would say, you know, on the left is the, you know, Teatro Nacional. It's a, you know, it's an exemplary uh, Baroque building that was, you know, et cetera. And I would get off the bus on a corner and, you know, walk to my godfather's house. And, um, and it really grew from there. Uh, I can't say that I had, I mean, I grew up as a conservative Jew. Uh, I went to synagogue. I grew up in a kosher home. Um, I can't say I really had religious feelings. Uh, it was more of an ethical education, but I really, I couldn't understand why people were devout. And this was just a very different feeling. Um, it was just a very different feeling. So it's really hard to, to parse as to what came first, the deep religious feeling, or simply, I guess you could say the awe, uh, a sense of respect. Um, and if one thing doesn't pull you in, it's going to be another. Uh, and I think that's what's kind of amazing about it. Uh, everybody has their ashe and the, the ocha really helps you pull out and develop that ashe. It's rec recognized by people in the community. Nobody judges you for having the eight different kinds of ashe that other people have. Um, people you know, honor you and praise you for the ashe that you have. And, um, you know, I found um, that going to my godparents' house, seeing them work, 
uh, and especially seeing what flawed human beings they were uh, and what flawed human beings were all around my godparents. I mean, you know, in time I learned that my godfather, Ebe Balera, um, Oturasa. Nobody wants to be Oturasa. I mean, it's it's a life of struggle. You know, there are no bad Ifa signs as far as I can tell. It's just that's what you you die and are born to. And you have to function on the earth in that set of conditions. And, you know, uh, but I have to say um, we clicked. We really clicked because, you know, he is a, he was an educated literate, highly ambitious Cuban from Santiago de Cuba. He came from a very wealthy family, um, but essentially he was kicked out of his family for being involved with a woman who was a grand uh, espiritista in Santiago de Cuba. And um, so as an educated person, it was as if he attracted all the cultural professionals of Havana who at the time were part of a movement of kind of getting beyond what they had produced in art as a cultural phenomenon and starting to get consecrated in Ocha themselves. And we're really talking about the late eighties um, when the religion was still uh, stigmatized. It really wasn't until the special period of 1993 that people could wear their necklaces openly. Uh, and so my sisters and brothers in Ocha, for example, Gloria Rolando, uh, who had made Oatala, um, I would be walking around Havana on the street with her and we were with others, you know, Gisela Arandia, you know, a journalist. And, you know, we'd be talking about the Ocha and I'd start so Gloria, you know, how is your Santo, whatever? And she go, <laughs> David, you know, we can't talk about this. Um, and just, it was really an education uh, in, in so many respects. Um, and I have to say, you know, people say that they love their godparents. Um, my godfather was very hard to love. Uh, he was a very complicated person with a very complicated contradictory history and if you know I'm not a babalao but if you just happen to flip through a DC and you look at Otorasa you're going to see what he has to deal with and um but I tell you he stayed up late every night that I was there and he wrote lectures hand wrote lectures on that long Cuban paper in capital letters um, and he would sit me down across from his, uh, his seat on the, con on the cons um, consultation table, and he would read me lectures as if he was a professor in the university. He didn't do that for anyone else. And um, he basically committed to be my guide, my intermediary, uh, and he did that for 15 years. And, you know, as many times as he swindled other people, uh, he never asked me for a dime. And so, you know, you see that kind of love and respect uh, coming from your own godparents, and it just, it just strengthens, you know, the reciprocity in it. So, um, I found all that impressive. I'm sorry for going on too long, but I hope that in some way that answered your question, you know. There's oh, a, a Uruguayan, I believe it is, uh, journalist by the name Edward uh, Eduardo Desnoes, and he has an article called "Cuba Made Me So." You go to Cuba, it makes you a certain way, uh, and, and there's really no going back. Yeah, it, it has an effect on you to the point where you almost feel like you've been adopted. You know, it's like uh, you're a part of that community. You've been accepted. You've shown the humility. You've shown the, the character that resonates so much with the public there. And, and once you're in, you're in. And, you know, before we move on to an, another topic, I, I really want to touch on uh, your godfather once more because, you know, within the fraternity of Ifa, he's definitely a gentleman that I've heard of. And, you know, it's ironic because for the longest period, 
um, for those who are at least coming into the religion at face value or beginning to hear about all of these different characters and personalities, for the longest time, the most recognized Oturasa was at Pidio Cadenas. May he rest in peace, right? Um, storied Babalawo for initiating so many, right? Um, but there were a couple others, right, who were Oturasa. And one of them was actually my great-grandfather, Marito Oturasa, who was one of the, uh, the personal students of Miguel Febles, along with Frango Beche. But even within them... One guy that was kind of in the shadows, and for the longest time there was this debate, and I believe Edmis was older as to who was older as far as Oturasa, who was the first Oturasa recognized on the island. And I, I want to say it was your godfather, um, you know. So I'm not sure if you ever had a conversation with him on that. Well, it took, it took years um I really started out in the genealogy and oral history of Ifa as early as 1986 um, and had done some basic genealogical work. But as far as the kind of oral history that you have to do in order to draw out of people and then organize in a way that you can actually make notes. Um, I knew Elpidio Cardenas. I, I would say that he was my friend. I first, uh, Edme took me to Elpidio Cardenas in, um, let's see, maybe 1991. I was staying at the Duville Hotel and he had an apartment on the second floor uh, in Galliano. Eventually uh, he moved. Um, and I did his a kind of skeletal biography. El, Elpidio, I believe, was consecrated in 1952 um and Edme was not consecrated until 1963 if you can believe oh. it he went into the room and came out of the room on the day that kennedy was assassinated oh, and Lord. uh everybody <laughs> was pointing the finger at fidel oh. very interesting <laughs> Jeez. so we're really talking 11 years younger wow. than elpidio um oh was, as far as I could tell, very grand uh, with his own, I guess you have to say, a checkered past. I mean, this is an extraordinary man uh, who, uh, in some ways, he was of the street. He was very tough. Uh, he was a gachotero, which is like a loan shark, a gachotero on the, mue on the muelle, you know, somebody who hangs around on Fridays and waits until people get paid. And where people spend their money. Um, uh, and so they had a lot in common. Um, but he was a very, he was a very tough man. He had a certain vanity to him. He liked to look well, dress well. Um, he was very, very smart, had a very good memory. Um, and I think he was, you know, very loyal. Um, I got to know a number of his godchildren. Um, he consecrated so many people that virtually nobody could say how many there were, but, uh, I got to be friendly with one of his godsons, uh, a Orlando Sierra, uh, they used to call him Pipo Largo, Osalo Fogbeo, who lived in Old Havana. And you encounter these people in Cuba who have nearly photographic memories uh, when it comes to the religion. And literally, almost in a single breath and out of his mouth during a single session, he listed for me name and sign and some dates, 84 godchildren that Elpidio had made. So he had made about 84, 90, you know, in the, the early 90s. I had some other people doing some research. As far as Edme, um, you know, everybody in this religion has an extraordinary story that essentially, it's kind of like a, a milestone or a flag. You keep returning to it as like the, the revelation of your consecration that stays with you. You know, Edme has... Um, you know, similar stories. It would take, you know, a half an hour for me to relate his story, but let's just say that he's uh, 11 years 
younger Ibai Bentanu um, than Epidio, but they did work together. Nice. Uh, there's another very prestigious Oturasa by the name of David Cedron, very po- prolific uh, consecrator. He was one of the first people, um, along with the important group um, that founded the uh, La Comisión Organizadora de Sacar la Letra del Año, uh, named after Miguel Febles, that took out its first sign in 1986, uh, along with David Cedron, Lázaro Cuesta, who really only had um, like four years in IFA, Fran Cabrera, um, Victor Betancourt, Guillermo Diago, and a lot of other people. And um, I think just last year, uh, most of them have passed on, with the exception of Frank um, and um, Lázaro Cuesta. Victor is still alive, but there have been some separations. I think um, Davi Cedron is considered uh, the elder. His Olofin was used to take out the sign, I believe, last year. Uh, and I haven't yet met him, so I haven't been back to Cuba since 2008, but it is a goal to go meet, uh, you know, the uh, the third important Oturasa of my life. It's definitely an Odu that has, uh, that has uh, followed you and blessed you in many different ways, whether it be knowledge or simply, you know, uh, a good memory. You know, David, you've, you provided... I mean, you, you talk about, you know, more than 30 years of, of work, you know, and, and you, you've had wonderful moments and have been able to uh, memorialize some of them in photography. And, you know, I'm here with Phil and, you know, one by one, we'd like to kind of go over, you know, some of the photos that, that you presented here to kind of let us know um, what context they were taken in and, and some of the information sure. behind them. You know? Sure. This is literally the first throne that I saw in my life and the first Oro Seco. Um, it's at Templo Bonifacio Valdez, uh, 1983, three years after the founding in 1980 by Luisito Castillo or Cheni Lobe. And probably people are going to debate this, but I, I would say the most famous Babalao to come out of Cuba that nobody's ever heard of. Uh, Osvaldo Morales Sr. Ogundache uh, and Ahijado of Jose Antonio Erice Baba Giogbe, wow. who in turn was an Ahijado of Tata Gaitan, Ogunda Fun. Of course, of course, yeah. um, they founded the temple together on uh, a side street off of Route 1 in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Um, in 1983, they consecrated this Anya, the name of which is Anya B. Uh, you see in the center, Luis Pauso, uh, who has become a very, very prestigious figure uh, in the popular and sacred music field in New, in New York. Uh, on the left, you see Roberto Borrell. Uh, a former member of the Conjunto Folklorico Nacional who arrived in the United States, I believe in 1980. Uh, there, were a, there was a whole group. Um, Frankie Malave was one of them, another, you know, just prestigious, uh, virtuosic, um, popular musician. Um, the gentleman on the right, I had known from the photography business in, in New York, uh, Ramiro Fernandez, uh, whose family left Cuba in uh, the late 50s. Um, and then uh, the woman, uh, she's putting an Amala Ila de Shango. Uh, what's extraordinary about this scene, uh, you know, when I first got there, I focused on the throne because uh, it, it was like, um, I just got, you know, it sounds contradictory, but I got hit in the face by something beautiful. Uh, and it is a throne for the Shango of Adolfo Fernandez Obadele, uh, who grew up in the barrio of La Correa in Guanabacoa. Um, he and his partner, Ramon Esquivel Banguala, child of Obatala, they were worried getting, about getting pinched by the state. In 1980, they heard people were uh, getting on a boat and going to Florida. 
via the uh, embassy. They walked onto a boat thinking, ah, oh, we'll be back tomorrow. And um, they did not go back to Cuba. Wow. Uh, and then, so essentially, you know, as of that moment in 1980, Adolfo, along with Miguel Angel Castillo, uh, both of them were in the Chrome Detention Center in Atlanta, and Luisito Castillo or Chenilogbe went down to Atlanta to pluck um, Miguel Angel Castillo, Oyecum Viroso, which was Herme Oturaza's son, out of the refugio. And um, Miguel Angel Castillo says, hey, there's this other guy there, Adolfito Oadele, he's an Oriate, you, you got to take him too. And so Luisito took them both to New Jersey. And, um, you know, in many ways, Miguel Angel Castillo became like the backbone of this temple as long as he lived. And Adolfo essentially became the Oriate of this temple with a very powerful, very beautiful Shango. Um, and uh, Melba Carrillo, uh, who was essentially let go as a, as a Yawo, um, separated from her godfather early, took on Adolfo as her representative godfather. So this throne was important insofar as that she was playing for the first time to the Shango of her new godfather. And um, that is the room. It's like a, you know, it's like a crucible. That is the room that, you know, in which I experienced the sound of the bata. And when you hear me speaking about all these relationships, which you, you know, it takes years to kind of integrate all these relationships, yes. but yes. it's really a kind of microcosm of the Cuban migrations, the Puerto Rican integration with Cubans in New York um, in, you know, a very dedicated, devoted uh, religious setting in a very unassuming place in a little house in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Wow. What you can see in the picture, uh, not only the bata drums, but if you look, um, the, the Paño of Shango in the center is part of uh, Ramon Esquivel's artistry. Uh, oh, you know, this is this is a kind of old school, yeah. old school throne. Um, nobody nobody does this anymore because everybody's interested in you know the the disco look. Um, but it's 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 very classical, almost like classical columns. And so you have the red and white, which reproduce the bead colors of Shango, but there are these very powerful classical columns. And then in the middle, you have this paño covering the uh, Watea of Shango, but it's shaped as a thunder axe. So, yes, you know, wow. when you look at this throne, uh, essentially you're looking at an enthroned thunder axe. It's, wow. And then, you know, you get the crackling of the lightning and the gold. It's, And then what you see beneath that uh, is a large uh, eshu uh, of the house. Uh, it's kind of hard to see the garabato over the head of it. But that's an issue that they consecrated uh, for the house. Um, you see on the floor uh, the O sign that accompanies the uh, bata drums. Um, and there's a little birthday cake for, uh, you know, for Shango. Uh, but it's, in fact, a drumming to respect. Uh, and I guess you could say to lift up Melba as, as a new godchild of Adolfo. Yeah, it's a tribute, definitely, but yeah. And, and just, go ahead. No, 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 I was just I was just saying you look at the old thronos and whatnot and um so much character, you know, just in the simplicity and just those little nuances like what you mentioned, just the way they would hide things in plain sight, you know, even with the uh with the O'Shea, of course, with the axe and um, it, it takes me back even to a time when, you know, as a young mm -hmm. man in Hialeah, you'd walk by and you see the drummies going on and you'd see the thronos and, you know, they, they did so much with so little and uh, the energy was incomparable. Well, if you can imagine the fact that when I went back to Cuba in 1986, uh, Adolfo made sure that I went to La Corea with his brother, Ariel, uh, his younger brother. Um, Ariel met me in Havana. Uh, I tried to dress up as best as I could. We got on the bus, uh, which was an experience because tourists don't ride Cuban buses. We went no. deep into Guanabacoa. And uh, let's just say that it was a very humble. People are afraid of La Corea. 
in Guanabacoa. Um, I also think it's the epicenter of some of the greatest creativity in Havana. It's where uh, Irian Lopez and Los Chinitos are. Uh, but Ariel took me to, oh yeah, Ariel, I want to see uh, Adolfo's house. I want to see his house, you know? And it was like this, it was this like little, like a little house made out of, you know, corrugated tin and patched together boards. And so you can imagine how humble things were in La Corea. And they went to New Jersey and they discovered that they could buy satin, silk, lame. Um, but they didn't go crazy uh, like, you know, 2000. They built very elegant tributes. And not to say that the new thrones are not tributes, but, you know, these are much more clear in terms of representing the colors and the numbers of the Santo in a very clear, elegant way. You know, you have six bars for Shango. Uh, of red and white. Um, for a Yemaya throne, you have, you know, seven bars of blue and white, just an example. Um, and the throne is really like a frame for the Orisha. And the throne, you can see in that picture, the even though it's, you know, blasting red and white at you, uh, it's still somewhat subtle. And then... It's, and then Shango in, is in the middle as if he's just arisen. Uh, it's, you know, it's quite extraordinary. It was very powerful for me to see. No, oh, definitely and impactful. And additionally, you know, it was a throne for Shango, but Ramon Esquivel uh, put up a little pano on the left for Yemaya, a little pano on the right for Oshun, and, and a pano up above for uh, Obatala. And, you know, it's a little world in a throne. You've got uh, Eshu, and then you've got essentially the four pillars of, of the religion. No, definitely a lot of character. And, you know, I'm a big fan of those things because that's where we come from. And I, I tell you, the, the energy, you know, they're creating that space. It's much more than decoration. You know, the numbers used, the cloth that's used, all these things. And, mm. you know, uh, beautiful photography and you know, now kind of going into the literature, you know, we're, we're really excited with this new release, apart from all the other releases where, you know, some of them are quite difficult to find now. You've blessed us with a copy of your most recent one. Tell us about this new book, Pataki, that, uh, that's been moving very quickly from what I can see. Well, I guess you could say that... Um... You know, Patakin is kind of a surprise book that I kind of pulled out of the hat um, during the pandemic. Uh, my two previous books, Santeria and Throned, were, was essentially a cultural history and art history yeah, of classic. the Lukumi religion. Uh, the Light Inside was a study of the Abaqua and its art in Cuba. Um, you could say that Patakin was one of the two books that saved my life. Um, I had some very serious health issues uh, starting in the fall of 2016, uh, which lasted for several years, including, you know, prostate cancer, three years of major depression, um, and a certain Baba Lawo, uh, who is the son of Oswaldo Morales Sr., uh, uh, is Oswaldo Morales Jr., Otura Pompeo. You know, I couldn't get out of bed in the morning for three years. And all of a sudden, I started getting phone calls from this guy I hardly knew. And um, he helped me get back to scholarship. I, I credit him with, um, you know, helping me pull myself out of this. Uh, he encouraged me to go back to the Babalao project. Um, I essentially sat down and spent close to three years writing that. It's now a thousand pages and uh, people are going to say, you're, you're nuts. You're the lunatic we always thought you were. Uh, why did you write a book that's a thousand pages long with 400 photographs? Um, 
but I took a break from that uh, in about 2018, 2019, and I kind of used as a point of departure my study of Baba Lowell's um, because it, you know, it's clear to anybody who looks at Baba Lowell's that their signs are key to their identity as they walk, you know, in the little slice of the mortal world that they get. Um, and so I had done biographies, um, but the signs were always mysterious. Uh, and so I wanted to be able to write a book that would not just be like a secular biography, but it would be something like a spiritual biography. And I needed to say something about the signs. So Turo Pompeo really started helping me summarizing, synthesizing some of the signs. And so I wanted to learn this myself. So I started going into the Tratado Encyclopedico de Ifa, which is like a nearly 3,000 page compendium put oh, together yes. in Cuba in the uh, 1980s and 90s, based on three or four principal Dice Ifas from the first half of the century. Um, and so I started plucking out, uh, for example, I was interested in Bonifacio Ades. So I went to Ogbeweñe and I translated from start to finish the Tratado of Ogbeweñe and all the Batakin. Uh, I was interested in um, Asuncion Bialonga, um, 1864 to 1953, he lived. And uh, so I translated the whole Tratado of Ogunda Masa, Adecina, Ovarameji, um, Nyobras Cardenas. Um, and so on and so forth. And so then I, I started putting them up on a blog and I realized at a certain point, wow, this is, nobody has seen this material except for Cuban Baba Lowell's who read Spanish or um, Baba Lowell's outside of Cuba who are Latino. And um, I just started expanding it. And um, I probably had 30 Odu or Tratados of Odu translated. Uh, and then I just sat down and I said, okay. And then there's a logic to it because, you know, if you're going to do 30, um, if you want to do anything like a book, you know, you know, you know that you're going to need a couple hundred. Um, and over the course of a year and a half, I sat here sometimes 12 hours a day, seven days a week, um, half the screen with the Tratado Encyclopedico and half the screen with a blank uh, Microsoft Word uh, page, and I would just go through it, go through it. And it was one of the hardest things that I'd ever done. I mean, my Spanish is pretty good. I would say that I'm fluent in Mexico <laughs> or Spain. And as soon as you go to Cuba, you, you basically have to throw out everything you know. Oh, yeah. Um, and the Tratado Encyclopedico is based on earlier tratados like Ramon Febles, Obetuan y Lara, uh, Tata Gaitan, Ogunda Fun, um, the Tratado of Pedro, the Diceifa Pedro Arango, which came out in the 1950s, which uses those two. And um, it's very clear that Febles and Gaitan were, they were lettered gentlemen they were tradesmen they were amazingly experienced they had gone to school um but you know they were not scholars and when you get to and the way that literature in cuba for the religion is put together it's not one person sitting down and writing the bible having heard the word of god it's dozens of people over many decades as they say recompiling you know all tratados come from recopilacion so you have, you know, uh, tables of pagina suelta, you know, that you've gotten from your colleague, that you find, that you've found, that you've stolen. And, you know, there are stories about Miguel Febles, for example, who studied at the site of Tata Gaitan, his Oyubona, um, as of his consecration into Ifa in 1923, um, uh, when he was a teenager. And he would sit at the side of Tata Gaitan and Tata Gaitan would go up, you know, go out and Miguel Febles would be yeah. looking around and he'd, you know, he'd pluck a piece of paper. And um, a lot of that, along with his father's material, fed into the Tratados and these Ifas that he had later. Um, and 
I mean, I'm told by friends of his who are still alive, who are in their 90s, that, you know, people would fly into Cuba with suitcases of money trying to buy his tratados. And, wow. you know, he wouldn't give them to anyone. You had to be yeah. his friend. Um, so that's all to say is that, you know, in many ways, the way I started, um, the book grew almost like Recopilacion because I was confronted with a 3,000 page compendium. I counted all the pataquin in that 3,000 page book. There are about 2,200, 2,300 pataquin. Wow. Some are repeats. That's 10 times the amount of pataquin that I actually managed to translate, which was 240. Wow. Um, and, you know, then of course, it took me a year to edit it, to polish it, because you're talking about many different people with different levels of education, writing Pataki with it. And so I put some of this Pataki material in front of a lifelong, a lifelong bilingual actually she speaks like 12 languages but she was an interpreter in the un she worked in spanish book publishing in argentina for 17 years she couldn't make head or tail of this i put it in front of many many native speakers both cuban and puerto rican but had who had pretty much grown up in you know middle class families um and they said well you know david maybe i can help you with this but your translation looks pretty good um <laughs> So, you know, I had a lot of help. I had a lot of help. Uh, Solimar Otero, uh, who's the chair of folklore in Indiana, helped me. Um, a number of Babalawos helped me. Uh, and, I'm, you know, Otura Pompeo helped me. Uh, Owani Bufun helped me. Iwolibara helped me. Um, Ogundaka helped me. Uh, it, you know. And... Um, so I got to 240 and people around me were saying, well, you know, there's, there are 256 Odu and Ifa, you really need to do 16 more. And I was like, I'm really tired. <laughs> um, and I stopped at 240 and it actually makes, it makes sense. Um, you know, I'm a Santero, I'm not a Babalao. I have no, you know, pretensions about being a Babalao, about being able to interpret Ifa, you know, this is a book written, translated by a Santero for Santeros. And I titled it in specifically Pataquin. Orisha stories from the Odu of Ifa. It is not a Dice Ifa. And in some ways, 240 says this is not an Ifa book because Ifa has 256 chapters. And so it was kind of like saying, you know, here is a compendium of stories, um, particularly for non-Spanish speaking practitioners. Um, and I very intentionally organized the book, not according to Odu, because, you know, the earlier Dice Ifas in the first half of the 20th century started with the 16 Magis as the first 16 chapters. And then, well, what do you start with? You know, you start with Ogbe Yekun, which is the, you know, quote unquote, father of combinations. You know, mm -hmm. it's the first, um, you know, uh, Omoluo chapter. And then you go through your Ogbe, you go through your Oyekun, you go through your Wari, you go through your Odi. The Tratado Encyclopedico actually does it more like an encyclopedia. You have the book of Baba Giogbe and all the Omoluos, the book of Oyekun, etc. cetera. Um, since I wasn't writing Adise Ifa, I said, well, how am I going to or organize this so it will be, so I can kind of slip it into the Santero community? And I said, well, you need to organize it by Orisha. And I said, well, how do you organize it by Orisha? And, you know, the most accessible organizer for us is the Oro Seco, where essentially you have, you know, 24 Orishas approximately that you are saluting. And so the Oro Seco organizes the chapter organization. And, you know, I didn't really invent nice. this because, you know, my elder, uh, John Mason, who wrote um, Orina Orisha, organized that book of Orisha songs by 
uh, the Oro of Santo. So I didn't need to reinvent the wheel, but it's it's really like uh, it's a mark. It's a way of saying this is not an Ifa book. I didn't organize it by the Medjis. I organized it for Santeros based on Orisha because we tend to think about the world and the religion in terms of Orishas and their relationships. And, um, you know, we tend to, you know, draw wisdom and moral lessons uh, and, you know, best practices from these patakin. Um, we have the Dilogun system and, you know, that's a, I guess you could say that's a Pandora's box in some ways too, but um, being, a, being a scholar, you know, I kind of couldn't leave it at, as just a compendium of stories because as a scholar, everything has a context yes. and you respect the literature by making reference to context. So it's not just Arisha chapters. Every Patakin, in fact, is identified by its sign. Um, and so on the left side of the page, you have the name of the Camino. On the right side, in smaller text, you know, is Iwodibara or, Oba, you know, Owunda Meiji. Um, and then every Camino should have a prayer. Every Camino should have at least one Ebo. And in the Tratado Encyclopedico, most of the Caminos have a series of notes. They have um, instructions for preparing the issues of the signs. But I basically, I didn't want to have free floating stories. I wanted people to be able to respect it the way that it was seen in the Ifa literature, even if, um, you know, a Santero is going to say, well, I'm not going to use this um, Patakin to, you know, make believe on my Babalao. It's just so, oh, this is the way it's organized in Ifa. I should respect this. And I should know from this moment on that. Every Camino, you know, we hear these myth, myths and they're on the internet and everybody's talking about the myths of the Orisha, but, you know, everyone comes from a specific Oldu. Um, Baba Ejiogbe in the Tartago Encyclopedico has 98 Caminos um, and it's a huge volume. Um, so I wanted to have the prayer in Lukumi, the Abo in Lukumi, and then the Patakin. And then sometimes there were notes by the writers uh, that I left in. So... Um, at that point I had a manuscript, uh, but I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I knew that, uh, I was not in academia anymore. I wasn't going to find a publisher. That little ding you just heard was a ka from my website. Someone buying Patakin. So I'm very nice, happy. There we go. That. See, we're invoking that. Technology. Um, here we go. I don't know <laughs> if you heard. <laughs> so I learned how to self publish. Uh, I designed the the book cover to cover. I, I designed the, the cover. Um, I sent it to the press. Uh, I shelled out a huge amount of money to uh, print the book, uh, but I did it all from my desk. That's what you call desktop publishing. I literally did not have to leave my desk for any stage of the book. And way back in, I guess it was the end of August, a semi truck pulled up and dropped off 300 books on the bottom of my driveway, put them up on my site. And uh, at the time, my site had been hacked and uh, someone went in and changed the banking payout information to their own bank and wow. Shopify shut down my site for three, you know, almost three months. So using my Facebook connections, I literally... I emailed, I called, I text messaged, I WhatsApped, I Facebook messenger, literally everybody I could think of and essentially forced them to buy this book. Um, and, um, you know, we go to, we go to an Arab market and they don't respect you if, if you don't haggle with them, for example. Um, they want to sell it to you at a high price and I want a lower price. I mean, in my case, I talked to people who couldn't afford $85 for the book, and that was the price I had to charge in order to, I calculated, in order to recover my money. But there were people who would never spend 85 on a book. So, you know, I haggled them to a bottom, to the bottom. I said, you know, can I put this book in your hands for $50? Can I put this book in your hand for $40? Can I put this book in your hand for $20? And, you know, so that was the way that I managed to sell out the first edition of, 300 and then 
it got very hard after that. I did a second edition of 300 and I'm now I'm down to about 30 copies. Wow. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Um, definitely, I'm definitely it may sure. go on to Amazon in the print on demand uh, system. I de I'm definitely sure we'll get some, uh, we'll get some movement after the day. Uh, you know, we've, we've, uh, you know, especially with the, all the information you're putting out, especially in a language that's accessible to so many of our viewers. Um, you know, so much effort, so much sacrifice. You know, uh, Dave, what is your ultimate goal now at this stage of a career that spanned decades, um, degrees, initiations? What, what do you ultimately want people to take from your literature, you know, as far as the message? the impact, what do you want them to take away from it? Uh, well, you know, people are going to think this is funny, um, but honestly, um, you know, I want to have a normal life. Um, I'm a normal person. I live in a small house in suburbia, you know, near the beach. I have, you know, two dogs. I cook for myself. Um, I'm divorced. Um, I raised uh, my son as a single father. I'm divorced. Uh, uh, sorry, did I say that <laughs> twice? Um, and you know, I want a tranquil life. Tranquil life. What what I want people to take away uh, is that first of all, you know, I'm a normal person who has a skill set because I'm privileged to have had an education. Um, and. I wouldn't say that I know how to think, but I wouldn't say that, you know, I have a lot of data in my head. One of the reasons to write a book is so you get it out of your head. And, you know, these are the books. So that's, it's over there. It's like, got it out of my head. It's over there. And it's a, you know, I consider it a kind of, I have to say, um, I'm actually very grateful that my site was set, uh, shut down for three months because every person who bought a book for me, I had initiated a contact and got to know them. And what I found in this community, it was just brought home to me again and again, like I spoke of in the beginning when I went to my first time, you know, people are so sweet and they are so kind and people are hungry for knowledge. And honestly, that's all I'm interested in because, you know, I've had this career. I left academia. Um, honestly, I could not cut it in academia. You know, my father said I was contrary and unpleasant. That's pretty much what people thought I was. Uh, but in fact, I was too sensitive for uh, academia. I, I was terrified. It was very difficult for me to go um, in front of a class of students because I had a a horrific time in my own, you know, high school, college education. So uh, I really just want to, you know, I, I'm a yoga practitioner. I have a 200 RYT. And one of the first things that people tell you in yoga is that I'm not teaching you yoga. I am sharing my practice. I am sharing where I've come to you in this class. I'm sharing with you what I learned in my own room, on my own yoga mat. And so, you know, I'm not this like dispenser of wisdom. I'm basically, I want to share with people like a love of learning. And a lot of people don't have traditional educations. And so, you know, people just need like a leg up or a hand um, to learn how to kind of think and organize, even just to do something as simple as you know, you don't have to read the whole book. You pick one story. You highlight some things you're interested in. You make some notes in a notebook. And you think about it. And maybe you go back and you read it again. And then next week you read another one. Um, someone just wrote me a message on WhatsApp. Um, something happened to her and almost like a consultation. She wanted me to tell her you know, what it meant. Um, and I was like, well, honestly, um, you have Patakin. 
immediately some stories come up for me in Patakin. I would suggest that you look in these chapters. Um, here are some examples, but you know, I get the, you have the book and it's the basis of a lot of work of mine and I'm going to help you do the work, but you have to do the work yourself. There's no, you know, there's no magic bullet. Um, there's no like a lung transplant or a heart transplant. You know, I can't transplant your brain or my brain into your brain. You have to do the amount of work that you need to do. Um, and you, you know, I'm a normal person. I make a lot of mistakes. I get confused. I do crazy things. I'm a lunatic. And you know, the next person is just as much of a human being and you just have to be forgiving of yourself. You're not going to learn it immediately. I mean, I say in the introduction, a lot of people are going to look at this like I first did. They're going to read a story and they're going to go like, you know, what just happened? You know, uh, whiskey, ta whiskey, tango, foxtrot, like, you know, what? And uh, I would say probably 50% of the stories, I still, they're like, they're like opaque. Uh, so I translated them, but that, that doesn't say at all that I understand them. And in terms of, and, and given the fact that they're stories from Mifa and I'm not a Babalawo, what, Otura Pompeo helped me, but he didn't consecrate me in Ifa. And my head is not, I have a, a I have a path to Ifa, but Obatala did not want me to pass to Ifa. And, um, you know, I have to say, uh, there's a very famous story. Uh, I think it's Baba Ajiogbe, Ahala, the constructor of heads. Um, and, you know, people who are not prepared get, you know, their heads just crack. And, you know, after a certain point, when I got to 240 stories, you know, my head basically cracked. I said, this is like, this is the glass ceiling and uh, I need to let this go. Um, and so if there's something to understand, I don't know, maybe I understand 10% of it. Um, but that's just, you know, I know my limitations. And everybody needs to know their limitations, but pretty much everybody's capable uh, if they do the work of, you know, learning what they need to learn. And if they're having trouble, you have to give them a hand. So I kind of think that that's what my... You know, that's what my goal is, really, just to have a tranquil life near the beach and um, just be here to. I want people to call me. I want people to text me, to email me and say, hey, you know, what's this about? Or, you know, can you help me with this or what other book, uh, you know, could I read? Um, you know. So, you know, that's pretty much what it is. Um, and as far as. You know what I'm doing? I just turned 66. Uh, I don't know how much time I have left. I'm hoping that it's, you know, I when I go to bed, I, I pray to the Lord. I say, please don't uh, take me during the night because I have a lot of work to do. And, um, you know, everybody has their work to do. Everybody has an ashe. Everybody has their work to do. Um, everybody has a family. Everybody has priorities. Everybody struggles. And... Um, so, you know, we're, regardless of like where I come from, um, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, well, you don't even have a right to be in this, you know, religion because of X, Y, and Z. And people in Cuba said to me, well, how can you have made Santo when you were not baptized in the church? <laughs> like, I don't know what to say, man. Um, and I went back and I told my godfather, Edme, he said, listen, David, I've heard this before. If someone asks you that again, you tell them that the true baptism is the lavatoria del santo. Uh, people get baptized in the church for all kinds of reasons. But um, so, you know, I needed a hand at that moment. And, he, you know, he gave me a hand. And um, I'm telling you, uh, one of the last things he said to me um, before he died um, and he had bad diabetes. I mean, he really suffered at the end. Um, I tried to give him money. I mean, on so many occasions, I would go to, um, 
you know, go to where I had my little stash in Cuba. I would take out $100. I would take out $300. I'd put them in an envelope. And my Baba Lahal colleague says, well, you know, you can't really walk up and just give them $300. You have to write this whole letter saying that this $300 isn't really just the money. It's it's a symbol for my appreciation with him. And I bring the money. And he goes, what are you talking about? Don't give me any money. Es mi deber. Um, I mean... I guess he just took me on because I knew he knew that I was the person with a certain skill set that could, you know, bring this to fruition. So, you know, uh, es mi deber. I mean, that's essentially what he passed to me is that concept. Uh, it's my obligation. It's my responsibility to uh, divulgar, to, you know, spread, to hand down. Um, so I guess that would be, that would, I go on for a long time, but that would basically be my answer to your question. I tell you, um, you know, I've heard of your godfather, not only from you, but from other brothers that had the privilege of meeting him, um, either getting initiated with his wife or him. Um, and they had fabulous things to say, but, but to hear that gentleman say, it is my duty to propagate Ifa to someone that is going to be able to spread it in a way that it is going to reach someone that is going to be able to have an effect. You know, may Olod Dumari receive him with the most open of arms um, for his work and his dedication of a lifetime to our culture. And I extend the same, um, the same commitment to you, my brother. Um, I, I resonate with you so much because to come from a culture, you know, even though I am half Cuban to, you know, have a, you know, uh, Eastern European background, um, Mediterranean background and have a whole nother aspect of me that really doesn't have much to do with West Africa. Um, it's inspirational because you came from a completely different walk of life and you've dedicated your life, your career towards demystifying something um, that so many people need and will continuously need and hopefully it really um allows the torch to be carried to where other people can pick up at whatever point the lord sees fit for all of us right so from our roots podcast and me personally my brother dr david brown we appreciate all of your work and um, we appreciate your time brother thank you thank you thank you very much awesome we'll be thank you everyone we'll i'm very here. honored thank you brother Family, thank you so much for watching today's episode. A couple closing notes I want to make. BotanicaCandlesAndMore.com is up and running um, mm -hmm. for all of your needs. We deliver. Um, the podcast is on all major platforms. We just reached 17,000 downloads. The membership program is up and running. You got to get in there. A bunch of exclusive content, material. If you're seeing those shorts and wondering which episodes those are from, they're from the ones in the membership program. So get in there and really start learning Ifa, right? And let's not forget. I love Speaking of the members. I, the, the interviews are great, but I, I, I do the hour to get right here. <laughs> this, is, this is what we lead to? All right. So these are member shout outs. Let's get it. For this episode, we have uh, the VIP members. We have TK. TK. We have Laja Rocks. Yes. We have Marco Antonio. Yeah. We have... Iawo Obamola. Oh, I love you, man. And we have Intuitive Talks with Myra. Get it, Myra. And then we have our premium super fans. We have Katrina Allen. Oh, yes. Giselle Otano. Hey, Giselle. And Frankie Salto. Frankie, yes. Yep. So don't forget, guys. It's super, super easy. It's literally the button that's underneath this video um, that says join. Our Roots Podcast, Joseph Abayifa. Until next time, see the light.